Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of the International Workshop on Clinical Pharmacology of HIV, Hepatitis, and Other Antiviral Drugs. Um, so I'm obviously um, very privileged to uh, uh, start the chairing of this second day, and uh, it's a great honor um, to uh, be part of this meeting, and actually, I have to admit that it's pretty impressive, uh, the quality of the presentations and discussions uh, that we had uh, in the first day. I really hope that the second day is as uh, fruitful and, and uh, will run uh, as smoothly. Um, so I would just to, uh, remind everyone that if you want to participate to the Q&A, you are more than welcome and encouraged to type in your questions. You can do so anonymously as well in the uh, menu, as you can see here. And, and uh, obviously, we will uh, like to thank the corporate uh, um, support for, uh, from the different companies. Um, the the um, um, session, uh, the first session this afternoon, is going to focus on the management of new antivirals and is going to focus on different approaches and technologies that are under development at the moment. And I have the privilege of chairing the session with Marta Bufito as well. The first um, presentation is going to be by uh, Edmund Caparelli, uh, that unfortunately, for personal reason, is gonna, not going to be able to join us uh, today. But uh, the, the positive side is thanks to the technology, we can actually see his presentations anyway. So Edmund is uh, one of the most experienced uh, uh, pharmaco, um, uh, pharmacometric experts at, uh, at the moment and is a clinical professor at the University of California in San Diego. He has a, 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 a great experience in setting up and optimizing uh, studies for uh, pediatric patients and integrating the use of uh, PKPD modeling in a variety of different applications. And today is gonna to present on pharmacologies of PNAPs. Uh, we're going to talk about the clinical pharmacology of anti- um, retroviral uh, drugs which are formulated as long-acting agents. These are my disclosures. So what is I'd like to thank the organizers and virology education for inviting me to speak on uh, the pharmacology of BNABs as they relate to um, treatment and prevention in HIV. I don't have any relevant conflict of interest. I plan to cover the rationale and development and the potential role of BNABs against HIV, uh, discuss pharmacodynamic targets for prophylaxis and treatment, which are different, touch on disposition of BNABs and elimination, including factors that can influence BNAB pharmacokinetics, and discuss newer treatment approaches, including BNAB modifications and their use in combination. So the current state of HIV in, in treatment prophylaxis options is, is so much different and, and improved over you know, what it was uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. We have dozens of agents approved of various classes for not only treatment, uh, also for preventing mother to trial transmission, PrEP, et cetera. We have a single dose combination. So going from large numbers of tablets and capsules, we now have single dose agents. We are also now moving into an era of, of long acting injectable antiretrovirals and even long acting oral agents. And I know that Dr. Flexer is presenting later in this realm. So, you know, having a new whole new class in terms of a whole new approach with BNABs, you know, where do they fit in or what are some of the unmet needs that they may help uh, in terms of uh, treating and prophylaxing? Well, I, I think one of the key ones is further simplification um, with this long-term treatment, um, adherence and treatment fatigue are a key issue. We also, because of these longer durations of therapy, we need to limit the development of resistance. Uh, Co-infection and some drug, drug interactions, especially with TB, um, are still a problem. And then in the realm that, that I work in, which is pediatrics, um, finding acceptable formulations and dosing informations for infants and young children is still a challenge. And while you know, there are dozens of agents available, there are only a few 
uh, that we have infant formulations that can be um, administered. So the BNABs um, do have some specific roles that they may fill, uh, certainly in PrEP, um, in uh, preventing mother-to-child transmission, especially during breastfeeding. Um, Non-adherent subjects, again, because they last a long time, um, and also because their resistance pattern is different, provide an opportunity uh, beyond what we currently have. On a smaller scale, that, that again, because the resistance pattern is different in high, patients with highly resistant virus, um, they may provide some benefit. And then acute use uh, of them early on in therapy may reduce viral load burden and enhance acquired immunity. And you know, they may be part of a cocktail of, of combination therapy towards uh, looking at a functional cure. So in evaluating potential uh, antibodies that would serve in, as uh, successful uh, BNABs, there are some key agents uh, characteristics that one looks for. So we're looking for broad and potent anti-HIV humanized monoclonal antibodies. And one aspect is potency and broadness aren't necessarily hand in hand. So we'll discuss that just a little bit later. We want something that protects adult and infant primate challenge models. So having something that we actually can assess preclinically before we actually take it into uh, human studies. Uh, we also want antibodies that have no identified anti-self properties. In other words, that uh, a concern of this class versus others is the ability to amount an immune response to the antibodies themselves. And we also want agents that protect against perinatal transmission during breastfeeding, such as PrEP. And some of the newer antibodies, um, such as VRCO1, fulfill many of these above features. Now, VRCO1 is, was the first monoclonal uh, that against HIV from the Vaccine Research Center. It's one that I've worked on a bit. There are newer generations that are more potent, but a lot of the talk and a lot of the data that is out there really focuses on VR1, and, and so it will predominate in the rest of my presentation. So this just shows a, uh, a graph of uh, some of the HIV antibodies looking at their potency and breadth. And, and on the far left in red is VRCO1. Um, it's, it was the least potent, if for lack of a better term, um, with you know, an, an IC50 around one, a median IC50 around one microgram per ml. And you can see that as additional agents have been evaluated, the median IC50s go down. Um, you know, uh, and again, these are uh, on a log scale, so most of them are, are about 10 times more potent. Um, the other th thing that I think is, is of interest to, to keep in mind is that while if you look at some of the agents, and in particular like N6, um, that the IC50 is about 0.5, if you go to the, at the very top, that's the one in pink, that not that many of the clades, and this was actually a, a group of B clades, about between 150 and 200 isolates, um, actually are resistant. So the ones that are totally resistant are the, the solid lines at the top. You can find agents that are more potent in this terms of the typical uh, IC50, such as PGDM 1400 and uh, the, the, one of the newer uh, VRC CAP 256, uh, where the median IC50 is lower, but they actually have a more isolates that are resistant. So again, that in, in some regards, there's a potency issue, which is related to the median bar here, as well as a breadth issue, which is related to the, the low frequency of totally resistant uh, viruses. In regards to targets for preventing transmission and also with the use of the BNABs, uh, we probably need lower antiretroviral concentrations, which would be adequate for prevention. Preventing mother to child transmission with just even zidovudine monotherapy reduced transmission by two thirds, despite the fact that this, you know, very underwhelming antiretroviral regimen did not change the maternal viral load. Um, subsequent to that, you know, we saw that using nevirapine, um, even single dose, um, could prevent transmission, although concentrations never achieved levels needed for treatment. More recently, pre-exposure prophylaxis regimens, which are much less aggressive than treatment regimens um, with FTC and, and tenofovir, have done a remarkable job 
in preventing transmission um, with almost all transmission occurring in um, those that, that basically don't take the drug. And most recently, looking at long-acting injectable agents in the case of uh, cabotegravir as a single agent given every eight weeks at a dosage lower than is being investigated for treatment um, prevents transmission uh, as well. And it actually is superior even to the tenofovir FTC combination. Along those lines, BNEBs and in particular VRCO one is being assessed for PrEP. And in this uh, setting, it has been given at a dose of between both 10 and 30 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks, which is much lower than has been studied um, when used in treatment and eruption and, and other situations. So if we look at the preventing transmission with weekly challenges um, in an animal model, um, we can see that this is three different ways of looking at uh, control and a couple of different monoclonal antibodies. That if you continue to give challenges to uh, primates, uh, the controls become infected very early, um, as here in, in the dotted, dotted black that, you know, after a few challenges, all of them are infected. Um, this is after a single dose of the monoclonal antibody. So if you take VRCO1, and remember, this was the first and, and the least potent that you can see that, again, while it's much better than control, that after 12 challenges, you know, all of the animals have been infected. And as you go to more potent agents, such as the 3117 and the 101074, that, that it gets extended further on out. When one looks at concentrations at which infection occurs, um, the monoclonal antibodies, the more potent agents, they're not, they do not occur until later. So again, that's why they occur there. Um, and again, the VCR01, again, it occurred between um, predominantly one to 10 microgram per ml. This can also be translated into the risk of infection um, by an individual challenge. And it's again related to the uh, sensitivity of the virus to the antibody, uh, the neutralizing capacity of the antibody. And so for the VRCO1 at a concentration of about 10, there's about a 10% um, chance from a challenge infection. As you go to the 101074 and the BN117 that are about 10 times more potent, that same risk occurs at a level of about one microgram per ml. So there is the, the concentration you know, effect relationship and it does seem to be related to the potency, the in vitro potency in these pre models. In contrast um, to the targets that we are shooting for and that, that at least are, are successful in the um, preclinical models, the concentrations for treatment are, are much greater. And this is some data presented a couple of years ago uh, using BRCO1 at a high dose, and this is at 40 milligrams per kilo IV every three weeks in ACTG uh, 5340, and in patients who had been suppressed on stable antiretroviral treatment. And the way the study was designed is that they were on stable treatment. They received three doses. The first dose was given at, at sort of week minus one. And this figure here shows the concentrations of VRCO1 over time after those three doses. Then one week after that dose was given, they went into a treatment interruption, which is the red line there. And then um, they were monitored for viral rebound. And the, the viral rebound on this graph is shown in those blue uh, diamonds. And what you can see is that some of the patients um, actually had viral rebound before they even got to their second dose. Most of them had viral rebound um, before they got to their third dose with just two uh, actually getting all three doses with having viral rebound. And these viral rebounds really occurred, you know, at concentrations predominantly over uh, 50 microgram per ml. So, you know, in the animal model where the 10 was good enough for prophylaxis, the 50 did not maintain viral suppression in, in previously suppressed patients. Uh, the one interesting other aspect of that is if you looked at the viral isolates in these patients at rebound, the two latest rebounds were the, the two subjects that had viruses with the most sensitive virus, i.e. they were the only two that had IC50 less than, than one. So again, um, the concentration effect relationship is there, but clearly uh, much larger, higher concentrations are needed for treatment uh, 
approaches with the BNABs than with prophylaxis. So I'm moving on to the aspects of the drug metabolism. And really, we look to the, um, the endogenous handling of IgG as the model for the monoclonal antibodies. And so if you think about the standard drug metabolizing enzymes that, that we are always focused on, they do, are not involved in the metabolism of, of antibodies. Um, and so therefore, all the drug-drug interactions and all the aspects with the cytochrome P450s and the conjugate phase two pathways are not really all that relevant. Also, the monoclonal antibodies, at least the full antibodies, are not well filtered. So the renal, um, the clearance is not a factor again, uh, not a major factor. So again, it's really looking at how IgG is, is processed. And so the, the cartoon over on the left here shows basically the antibody um, being uptaken by uh, endocyte endos into the endosome. And again, yeah, that's the antibody. Um, these are these FCRN receptors within the endosome, or actually within the reticular endothelial system, as well as albumin here. Um, it actually does bind as well to the FCRN. So it's, it, it doesn't play a direct role, but potentially an indirect role by uh, limiting the availability of the FCRN. Once in the endosome, the pH drops, and as it drops, while this is, as long as it stays bound to the FCRN, it's protected from metabolism, but it actually undergoes, um, if it becomes detached, it becomes metabolized and degraded. If it maintains binding, um, it has the opportunity to be recycled into the, the circulation through the cell surface. And so again, the unbound IgG is degraded um, at pHs less than 4.5. Uh, the other aspect of that is that that provides an opportunity to um, alter the kinetics of exogenous uh, monoclonal antibodies. One other aspect over here just to, to touch on is that when we're giving these uh, compounds exogenously, we have to consider the absorption as well. And so clearly, the, uh, either by Q, uh, which is the, the root, but they can also be given IM, administration, there may be some pre-systemic degradation. So that has to be taken into account. And then um, the other aspect is that there can be mounted immune response to the antibody itself. Um, and so we have to evaluate for ADA or antidrug antibodies, which can alter the PK, as well as the target itself. If there is a lot of antigen present, one can see target mediated drug disposition. This is a, an issue that is, uh, can be prominent with some of the anti-cancer uh, monoclonals, uh, especially in solid uh, tumor types. And just to, you know, graphically display in a preclinical model what the impact of having ADA development is. Um, this just shows two curves of animals, one with and one without ADA, um, that, you know, you can see identical values initially early on, but once the ADA has, starts developing, the concentration time profile drops off precipitously over time. Um, this is uh, clinically very relevant for some of the anti-TNF therapies for inflammatory bowel disease as well as rheumatoid arthritis um, has been well documented. It hasn't, uh, there are no good examples yet uh, of this phenomena with BNABs that uh, in terms of at least directly linking to PK, although anti-drug antibodies uh, can, be, can develop. As I mentioned before, um, that the binding of the FC region to the FCRN receptor um, in the endosome protects it from endosomal degradation and allows it to be recycled. It also provides the opportunity that if one can modify the FC region so that the binding is tighter and it doesn't dissociate um, at that lower pH, that one could then protect it and extend the half-life. And so this is a um, approach that has been incorporated with uh, into several monoclonal antibodies, um, not only just for the, the anti-HIV antibodies, but we're seeing it now for RSV as well in terms of those antibodies extending the half-life by modifying the binding of the FC region. So the resulting antibody that's the, that, that is out, one of them is that BRCA1 with a two amino acid substitution in the FC region um, stabilizes the 
that interaction in the acid environment and therefore uh, prolongs the stability and, and half-life of the VRCO1 LS versus VRCO1. Taking this clinically, or at least preclinically, I should say, um, is, is shown here. And this shows that if you do that, and this was a um, single dose, again, study control with multiple challenges over five days. Control, all of the um, control animals developed HIV or SIV, as you can see, at measurable levels. The wild type here, this is the wild type VRCO1. You can see that the majority of them did also uh, develop HIV. V, although um, there were some that did not develop SIV um, over time, and it was delayed a little bit relative to the wild type. However, if you look at the animals that got the VRCO1 LS, what you can see is it actually about two thirds of the animals never got infected, and that was because of the prolonged exposure of VRCO1 LS. And so that even those that did get infected, um, the it did not occur until a later time. And again, this was uh, just the result of modification of the FC region to promote a, a slower degradation and uh, higher concentrations over time. So in the, the, the human studies and the phase one studies, the, when one looks at the VRC01 LS um, versus VRC01, that you can see that there is a very large impact, in fact, more than a 50% reduction in the um, clearance and the half-life uh, more than doubles um, when one makes that modification. And so again, here the blue line being the, the LS, uh, and this is, and the, the black being just the, uh, the VRC01 uh, wild type. The other thing that is that we also see here is that the variability is actually pretty small. In other words, that you get consistent levels with the dosing. Um, we also have evaluated VCR1 in infants, um, again, with the goal there of having the uh, availability of an agent to give to newborn infants to prevent transmission via breastfeeding. And what you can see here is that in dose normalized concentrations, um, First, the infants rapidly get level get high levels, which is good because it's being given sub Q, um, and then they are overall higher than adults, despite the fact that during this time period there's significant growth, which actually contributes um, a dilutional effect um, on the concentrations that are observed. A also very important uh, aspect has to do with HIV status and. Uh, BNAB pharmacokinetics. And I'm just giving two examples here um, of situations where when one looks at HIV infected versus HIV uninfected um, individuals, that the pharmacokinetics are significantly different. And so on the left here, this is um, data out of the Rockefeller group and, and, and Kasky's group that shows over a tenfold range that if you look at non-infected versus infected individuals, the half-life is about half as, it's cut in half in those that are HIV infected. So there's a much more rapid elimination. Um, we've also done a population study of HIV negative versus positive um, evaluation of VRCO1, and which is on the right here, you can see that the uh, light blue dots, which are the HIV positive, um, also have a more rapid elimination, although not as dramatic as the um, 10, 10, 74. You know, whether or not there is some issues related to inflammation or related to some target-mediated drug disposition is unknown. The fact that, the, that across doses in the uh, 10, 10, 74 data that it is seen consistently um, might suggest that inflammation, you know, is playing a significant role. The other thing that uh, is of interest is that because we don't get full coverage with all agents, that combining BNABs might uh, enhance, um, be, might be a good strategy to evaluate, and it may actually enhance acquired immunity. And so this is a small study, but a very interesting study that was presented at Croy in 2019, at least the results where 
you know, they saw three responses. If the, if the virus was not sensitive to the BNAB, uh, you saw no effect. You saw ones that saw an early rebound on the right here, which is kind of what you'd expect is the concentrations of the, the, the two different BNAPs. Now here they're giving 10, 1074 um, and BNC 1117, um, and those are the concentrations in red and blue. Then you see the rebound that one would expect as the concentrations go down, that you, you see the rebound expected. And then there was this other group here though that saw a late rebound so that when you gave these two together, you saw the reduction in the, the, the viral concentrations, but even after the BNABs had sort of disappeared, there was sort of a maintenance or at least a prolonged um, uh, time before rebound with some in later studies uh, taking up to a year to get out. So I think that there's some interesting aspects, especially um, you know, some ideas with different targets where the BNABs may have some additional effects other than just direct neutralizing activity. And so we're seeing you know, more evaluations of combining therapies together. Um, another idea of, of combining because of, of volume issues, et cetera, is looking at developing or constructing antibodies that actually hit different targets on, on the virus. Or, uh, and so this actually is looking at bi and tri-specific BNABs where modifying now here the variable regions to have elements that have um, binding from other antibodies that we know uh, other BNABs can be put together in a single molecule. Um, there is a, a this SAR441236, the Sanofi tri-specific antibody is currently be, being evaluated. Um, and you can see that it actually has elements for, from three different antibodies. And from that perspective, you, you broaden the, the scope of activity that one can get. And we will see how this moves forward in trials here, phase one. And so the, the other aspect to be thinking about for these combined antibodies is that um, given the situation that we are with, with COVID as well, that we are looking at combined antibodies for COVID as well as HIV therapy, I think there's some important similarities as well as differences to consider here. Um, but I think that this, the, the concept of combination of a uh, an antibody cocktail, I think is, you know, has merit across both. Looking at COVID, the, the antibodies were developed uh, with a spike protein as a target. And an important characteristic is identification of neutralizing antibodies was different. So again, the COVID, you know, from more of a pooled population, um, a very rapid responded or a very rapidly developed antibody in the population was utilized. Where in HIV, it's important to recognize that these were taken from these long-term um, non-progressors. So in other words, there had already been a pre-selection for antibodies that seemed to um, do well with long-term infection without generating resistance. Uh, there's also the, within that context, the difference in the duration of treatment and prophylaxis in these two situations. So again, um, when we've come forward with a lot of the, the BNABs for HIV, that these, again, are coming in a situation where they are done or they've, they've been evaluated long-term or at least seen in situations where they've been used long-term, both for prophylaxis and treatment, whereas COVID, it's, at least at this point, has been a shorter duration, so we haven't selected out those. And in the HIV and developing them in the labs, they are take multiple passes to develop the HIV BNABs um, uh, you know, because of that. And so accordingly, the impact of single monoclonal antibodies for COVID has been disappointing due to rapid uh, resistance development. Um, the, the figure on, on the right there just shows that, that if looking at, at viruses that were initially sensitive, that even after one pass, a, a, a almost half were resistant. And then after two passes, um, the resistance became high. And so again, um, looking at combined monoclonal antibody cocktails with different strain coverages is under investigation in a couple of trials. Um, there's probably more out there, uh, but this is a fast moving area. And, and hopefully some of the information that we learn from that will also have relevance and help guide us in some of our uh, BNAB uh, combination therapy for HIV. In conclusion, um, exploration of BNABs against HIV has gained interest, particularly for prophylaxis. Um, and 
you know, from my perspective, I think in, in the infant population in particular, where we have much, many fewer options, um, they also, from an intensification to limit initial viremia and reservoir seeding, adherence because of the long half-life, I think is important. And then multi-drug resistance, um, you know, you combine the BNABs and you don't have the, the cross resistance um, that one sees with other antiretrovirals. However, you know, we have so many good agents um, currently that the potency of the oral antiretrovirals, as well as some of the new longer acting um, injectables limit and the limited IgG distribution limits the role of BNABs probably as initial therapy. Um, Sub-Q administration and consistent pharmacokinetics make it attract for prevention and early treatment. And then combination BNAB and modification in the FCRN and variable regions are being evaluated to enhance, enhance clinical utility. Fantastic presentation and thanks a lot, obviously, Edmund. A real shame that Edmund cannot be with us today, um, but I'm sure that there's going to be opportunity for uh, discussing these type of applications in the future with Edmund uh, or in other meetings as well. So I will uh, obviously like to introduce the next speaker now that uh, is Dr. Marta Bofito, which is our consultant physician, clinical researcher lead. Uh, at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, as well as a reader at the Imperial College in London, UK. Uh, not only a great friend, but also a great scientist uh, running a broad variety of uh, research projects and clinical trials on different aspects of uh, and, and, and complex pharmacological issues. And today she's going to present uh, a clinical pharmacology of long-lasting uh, antiretrovirus long-acting drugs. What do we mean when we say long-acting? Why would we use long-acting agents? And when we look at drug concentrations of long-acting drugs, are these the same for everybody? Are we studying the right populations? Are we studying everybody who needs these drugs? And there's been a lot of talking about the pharmacokinetic tail of long-acting drugs. Do we need to worry about it? And what about drug-drug interactions? Do we need to worry about them? Do they disappear when a drug is formulating as a long-acting agent? So hopefully we're going to answer some of these questions. So a long-acting drug is a drug that is slowly absorbed in the systemic circulation and is slowly eliminated, excreted. It persists in the circulation in tissues for prolonged periods of time and is also effective for a long period of time. The objective of a long-acting drug is to be administered less frequently than daily, than ideally once a day, which is already a good uh, objective that has been uh, achieved in antiretroviral therapy. But we can clearly do better. And this is where a lot of research is focusing at the moment. So long-acting drugs can be given orally and uh, maybe uh, with once a week, once every other week administration or even longer, parentally, so either intramuscularly or subcutaneously, uh, every one, two, three, six months, or they can be administered by, by an implant or a device and this may be um, changed, renewed every six or more months. So the benefits of a long-acting drug is that they increase the choice for the patients and they increase the convenience and the health privacy if people don't have to take pills every day. They help and simplify adherence. And sometimes they may reduce the amount of the active, active drug that is administered. This slide shows the concentrations with the blue continuous slide that a long acting agent would achieve in plasma compared to those that are achieved when a drug is administered orally once a day. So in terms of the um, concentration window, therapeutic window, the rule is the same. Uh, drugs must be above the minimum effective concentrations to have to avoid to fall in a uh, 
area where concentrations are too low to be efficacious um, and must be below a maximum safe concentrations to avoid toxicity. But this would be achieved over a longer period of time than 24 hours. So how can we deliver long-acting drugs? Uh, as I mentioned, there are many different ways, some of which can are either oral by pill, uh, either because the drug is nanoformulated, for example, or either because uh, they're contained in a particular device that persists in the gastrointestinal tract for a long period of time. They can be given subcutaneously, they can be, can be given uh, by implant or other devices, or they can be administered intramuscularly. And it is what we are going to mainly focus over the next 15-20 minutes, long-acting drugs that are administered intramuscularly. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because of the two um, drugs that have been studied um, over the past few years and are now becoming available for the treatment of HIV infection and are rebizling long-acting and cabotegravir long-acting that are combined and have been studied again in phase one, two, three studies and are becoming available for the treatment of HIV. So unfortunately, uh, we have solid phase three data. Atlas and FLAIR are the two randomized open label international phase three studies that have demonstrated no inferiority of switching to monthly intramuscular injection of cabotegravir plus rebivirin long acting versus current antiretroviral regimen taken orally once a day. So we know that the combination of rebivirin and cabotegravir intramuscularly is not inferior to oral treatment. This slide shows the concentrations of cabotegravir and rupivirin long acting when are administered every month in Atlas and in Flare. So importantly, there is a leading oral period of approximately six weeks. And this is because of safety requirements to make sure that people are not allergic and tolerate cabotegravir and rupivirin. And then there is a first injection that you can see is at the beginning of the graph so when the concentrations are, are indicated, so the beginning of the concentrations curves are indicated, which is a higher injection is to favor the loading of the drug, to favor the, 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 the achievement of therapeutic concentrations of the drug. So cabotegravir is given six milligram, 600 milligrams and repivirin is given 900 milligrams. And then a lower drug, so cabotegravir 400 milligrams, repivirin 600 milligrams are given every month. And this is what you uh, see uh, in terms of uh, what concentrations are achieved. And the important thing is that these are indicated as median and uh, 5th and 95th percentile, and they are well above the uh, protein binding corrected IC95. Uh, However, there's more to say about the concentrations, about the drug exposure of uh, long acting agents. So, in terms of cabotegravir, the pharmacokinetics um, may vary because of sex at birth and BMI. Four weeks following the first injection, the median carbotherapy concentrations were lower in females than males by 40%. However, interestingly, at week 48, concentrations were slightly higher in females than in males. And for what concerns body mass index, four weeks following the first injection, median carbotherapy concentrations were lower in individuals with body mass index above 30 by 46% compared to those with a BMI below 30. But at week 48, this difference wasn't present anymore. And for what concerns repeaters, differences between sex, different sexes and a baseline BMI was, uh, were not observed. Importantly, there were a 
good percentage of women that could be studied in the Atlas and Flair studies. So 20% of women, 20% uh, of participants were women and 36% were black or, or African American. And these are the concentrations that were um, achieved in women versus men on one side of the graph, one side of the slide. And you can see again that women have lower concentrations at the beginning and higher concentrations at the end of the graph at week 38. And similarly, people with high BMI, BMI higher than 30, have lower concentrations at the beginning of their therapeutic history with long acting insulin. However, in terms of pharmacodynamics, there were no difference in virological response between women and men. Both women and men achieved high rates of virological response in Atlas and Flair. Worth mentioning the next step, which is Atlas 2M. So Atlas 2M is a clinical trial that compares administering cabotegravir with fibrin log acting once a month versus every other month and administering the long acting agent every other month was non inferior to administering them once a month, was well tolerated with low grade injection site reactions developing and was preferred by study participants. And we're very much looking forward to see the PK data for Atlas 2M to look at the concentrations of the drug and what happens to them. So, what about if someone who is taking, who is administered long acting agents for the treatment of HIV, misses an appointment and doesn't show up to the clinic, to the pharmacy, to receive the next injection when the injection is due. So this is what we mean for PK tests. The concentrations of the drug will inevitably decrease and reach concentrations that are around and then below the minimum effective concentration. So there will be a period where there's not enough drug to inhibit viral replication. The virus will start to replicate and the drug is still present, but again at low concentration. So we're in a, the context of selective pressure with viral replication. And therefore we are observing a, a situation where there's a high risk for developing resistance to the drug. And this is known from either animal studies for cabotegravir, animals that uh, were administered cabotegravir stop cabotegravir uh, administration, uh, when cabotegravir administration was stopped and then they received, uh, they were infected with seed and uh, when the virus replicating the presence of the drug developed integrase inhibitor associated mutations. And also for repivirin, we actually had a case uh, in uh, Chelsea Risk Victor Hospital when we ran the phase one, two uh, PrEP study where an individual was infected by HIV um, during uh, the repivirin long acting study and, and developed uh, um, mutations uh, during the study, mutations to NMRTIs. So we know this is a possible, and that's what we will have to try to avoid in clinical practice. So the pharmacologists developing these drugs have, um, are suggesting some important strategies uh, called bridging strategies to ensure that if people cannot present to the clinic uh, when they need a second injection, they, there are some alternatives, some solutions, some remedies that we can suggest in order to avoid uh, that the concentrations achieve um, low levels so that are at risk of developing resistance. And um, oral bridging is uh, one of these strategies where, um, again, someone can take oral therapy between one injection and the other if the interval is longer than suggested. And uh, this has been uh, uh, done by modeling. So if uh, an injection, so for example, if the fourth injection 
if you look at the bottom two graphs, if the forced injection is delayed by four weeks, you can see that the oral bridge in black would allow to overcome the risk of achieving concentrations that are too low to work, to inhibit, uh, to maintain a, an undetectable viral load. Similarly, at uh, A2020, data were presented for Rilpivrin. Uh, bridging strategies are possible uh, with oral Rilpivrin. And uh, again, an oral bridge with 25 milligrams of Rilpivrin once a day, followed by a 6 milligrams uh, injection of Rilpivrin long acting. Uh, if the time between injection is less than two months, it can be uh, implemented or with nine milligrams if the time uh, between the injection is more than two months. So this is good advice that we will adopt in clinical practice. So what about drug-drug interaction? So when you don't administer the drug uh, orally, there are some potential drug-drug interactions that are overcome, that are not going to happen. Uh, so dr some of the uh, drug-drug interactions mechanisms that occur at the level of the gastrointestinal tract are um, when, when a drug is uh, absorbed by a pH-dependent uh, mechanism, uh, drug chelation, trespass metabolism, gastrointestinal tract transmembrane transporters can be behind drug-drug interactions. Well, all of these mechanisms are not um, a problem when a drug is administered intramuscularly. However, drug-drug interactions are not completely disappearing for long-acting agents because these drugs are still metabolized by the liver, for example, or others may be still eliminated by the kidney. So in this case, um, it's just quite difficult to study drug-drug interactions because of the long half-life and the persistence of the drug concentrations study designs might last many months and are difficult to, uh, to be implemented in vivo. Therefore, modeling and PKPD um, strategies might be useful to understand drug-drug interactions for long-acting agents. And this is what uh, the uh, group from the University of Liverpool did. They looked at the uh, they modeled the concentrations of uh, intramuscular carbapenem and ripivirin in the presence of a, a strong induced rifampicin, and they showed that the concentrations of both drugs would remarkably be, be decreased during uh, co-administration with rifampicin. So we focus mainly on ripivirin and carbapenem because they are the first drugs that have been developed. And I think we will learn a lot. We are learning a lot already from uh, clinical developments and we will learn a lot when the drugs are implemented in clinical practice. And this will allow us uh, to be more knowledgeable when other long acting antiretrovirals will be available. Discovering units are focus very much on giving less drugs and looking into new mechanism of action and developing long-acting antiretrovirals. So we know about other long-acting drugs that are being developed. So is Latravir, for example, is a nucleotide reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. And uh, it has been um, studied following the uh, placement of a, an implant in uh, uh, healthy volunteers and the concentrations achieved have been modeled to show that 62 milligram implant uh, can lead to concentrations above the threshold for at least 12 months. So this would be uh, fantastic for pre-exposure prophylaxis and also for HIV treatment when a uh, drug that it can be combined with would uh, become available. Another very promising long-acting drug is lenacapavir, which is a first-in-class uh, capsid inhibitor, uh, and uh, it is being developed as an oral formulation, but also as a subcutaneous long-acting formulation. And uh, this graph shows the pharmacokinetic results 
of the study, of the phase one study. And you can see the concentrations in healthy volunteers. And you can see that um, this formulation supports six month dosing because the concentrations were maintained above the target for uh, up to 26 weeks uh, with uh, a uh, re remarkable inhibitory quotient. So to conclude, uh, the development of injectable and implant and other long-acting formulation is indeed exciting. And uh, it is worth to learn about the pharmacokinetic tail, about different population exposure, about bridging strategies now as much as we can, because this is hopefully the future of HIV treatment. And also remember that by skipping the gastrointestinal hepatic first pass metabolites, those drug interactions are likely to be fewer for uh, systemically administered drugs, but they're still present and modeling can be important when these drug, drug interactions are difficult to study in vivo. And uh, I focused on the pharmacokinetic of the drugs. I didn't talk about implementation challenges. I think we will face a few over the next few years, but hopefully, uh, again, we will learn to uh, use these drugs and uh, uh, the implementation challenges into clinics will be uh, overcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so Marta, for the great presentation on, on long acting and, and clinical challenges and and, and opportunities as well as moving forward. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Charles uh, Flexner, uh, which is a professor who is a professor of medicine, uh, pharmacology and molecular sciences, as well as international health um, at the John Hopkins, uh, John Hopkins University. And uh, as you well know, uh, leads um, uh, several different research uh, initiatives, including the long acting and extend release antiretroviral research research program, which is an NIH funded uh, initiative to provide support through um, a variety of different tools uh, for um, um, uh, investigators and, and uh, academics develop, developing long acting formulations. And, and so um, Professor Flexner is gonna now present novel formulations and devices of, uh, of antiretrovirals. Flexner from Johns Hopkins University. And I'm going to be talking for the next 20 minutes about novel formulations and devices in development for uh, treatment and prevention of HIV. Here are my disclosures as required by the organizers. I'm going to talk mainly about antiretroviral implants and uh, antiretroviral uh, microarray patches, that is transdermal uh, antiretroviral therapy. Um, you've heard already from Dr. Bofito about the use of intramuscular injectable long-acting antiretrovirals. And I wanna shift gears and think about other possible ways to deliver antiretroviral drugs. Specifically, first, we'll talk about implants, and I'd like to address this question, why even consider implants in the place of uh, long-acting uh, injectable uh, ARVs? Well, long-acting antiretroviral implants do have some potential advantages over injectables. They are removable, particularly in the inert, non-erodible forms, or in the early stages of erodible forms, as we'll discuss shortly. They provide more consistent and predictable drug release. Their pharmacokinetics are not dependent on the injection site, as may be the case with intramuscular injections. And they can remain in place for years. In the case of uh, contraceptive implants for up to five years after a single implantation for the inert, non-degradable subcutaneous versions. They do, however, have some potential disadvantages over injectables. They require a specialized device for insertion and a minor surgical procedure to remove them. They should be removed if they're not bioerodable because simply palpating the device does not tell you how old it is or how long it has been in place and whether or not it's still releasing drug. These devices are regulated both as drugs and devices by regulatory agencies like the FDA and the EMA, which complicates their regulation 
but may also make it more difficult to move them to a generic marketplace for low and middle income countries. The greatest experience with implantable devices for drug release is in long acting implantable hormonal contraception. Over 40 million women worldwide use injectable contraception um, and nearly half of mo modern contraception users in Sub-Saharan Africa rely on injectable or implantable contraceptives to prevent pregnancy. Women report that returning to a healthcare provider for an injection every two to three months is a disadvantage of DMPA, the most commonly used injectable contraceptive. And discontinuation rates of injectable contraceptives are therefore high, contributing to the growing popularity of long-acting implants. Levonorgestrel implants, which are available in several generic forms, are now used by millions of women in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they are manufactured and uh, administered quite inexpensively. The cost for a generic levonorgestrel implant in Sub-Saharan Africa is now less than 15 US dollars, or about $3 per patient per year for effective hormonal contracep contraception making this approach quite cost effective. The implant quandary, however, is whether to develop your drug delivery as an, in an inert, non-erodible form or in a bio-erodible form. So what is a bio-erodible implant? This is a, a drug delivery a procedure that many of us are unfamiliar with in the anti-infective field. Here are some figures from Eric Apple at Stanford University showing one example of a bioerodible implant. In this case, a polymer nanoparticle hydrogel. The polymer is mixed in a syringe right before injection. And when the polymer is injected, it forms a semi-solid glob that absorbs water and is slowly degraded over time. And that's shown in this figure. This kind of hydrogel can be used to greatly extend the apparent half-life of delivery of candidate drugs. In this case, a monoclonal antibody. Shown in the black figures over here are the, is the relatively rapid clearance from the blood of this monoclonal antibody in mice as compared to the very extended and slow release of this monoclonal antibody when delivered as a nanoparticle hydrogel. One of the great advantages of bioerodible implants is they do not have to be surgically removed unless the recipient has a significant adverse drug reaction, which would allow the hydrogel to be removed soon after injection and before it starts to erode. What can we learn about the value of bioerodible implants from their use in other disease areas? Well, it turns out that tens of thousands of people have received bioerodible implants for the delivery of, of therapeutic hormones. Um, the most popular of these is luprolide acetate or Lupron, often used for the control of prostate cancer. This is a gonadotropin-releasing hormone receptor agonist. These GNRH agonists are small peptides that are widely used for the treatment of prostate cancer, breast cancer, endometriosis, and central precocious puberty. Bioerodible implants have been used to deliver luprolide, gasserelin, as well as non-erodible implants for the delivery of another GNRH um, agonist, hysterelin. They consist of the drug co-formulated with a biologically inert polymer, usually a polylactide glycolide, PLGH or PLG. The implant system may be preformed and injected subcutaneously as was shown in the example from Eric Apple, um, or they may be administered after they harden as a small rod. The implant then dissolves over a period of one to 12 months 
releasing drug as it erodes. The safety and tolerability of these, of these implant systems in humans is generally excellent, suggesting that they may hold promise for the delivery of drugs for HIV and other infectious diseases. This is an example of the pharmacokinetic profile of one of these GnRH agonists, a hysterelin or suprelin, showing its very gradual release from the implant over a period of 12 months. The different uh, lines represent different kinds of patients, uh, but they all have roughly the same pharmacokinetic profile. I want to turn now to non-erodible implants being developed for treatment and prevention of HIV and talk specifically about Islatravir, which is being developed by Merck. Islatravir has been looked at in uh, a variety of uh, implant candidates. And here is a figure from a paper published by Stephanie Barrett and her colleagues two years ago looking at three different implants designed for a slow release of Islatravir over time. These are data from rats showing the concentration time profile in the plasma of, of Islatravir or MK8591 over a period of up to 600 days. The two implants on the left in A and B are actually bioerodible implants but the implant on the right in C is a non-erodible implant based on the polymer EVA. All three of these implants can release effective concentrations of Islatravir for greater than 180 days after a single implant, and modeling data suggests the potential to provide coverage in humans for a duration of up to a year with one of these implants. In fact, there is now proof of concept in humans for a non-erodible Islatravir implant. These are data that were presented last year at the IAS meeting by Randy Matthews from Merck, showing the concentration time profiles of two different solid state non-erodible Islatravir implants in healthy human volunteers. And what we can see is that both of these implants maintain average concentrations over the target for the entire 12 week duration of uh, the implantation. And after the implant is removed, the Islatravir is cleared from the system, in this case, measured by the intracellular Islatravir triphosphate, the active metabolite, at a rate that is similar to that of orally administered Islatravir, suggesting that there is no prolonged reservoir of Islatravir after the implant is removed. This implant with 62 milligrams of Islatravir delivers much higher concentrations in the studied individuals and this implant is being further studied in phase 1b and phase 2 as a possible preventive agent or PrEP agent for HIV and may eventually be combined with other agents for treatment. This is what the Islatravir solid state non-erodible implant looks like. It's based on the same technology used for the Nexplanon or etonogestral contraceptive implant that is also made by Merck and uses the same applicator for insertion into humans. I want to, however, insert a note of caution about implants, um, both erodible and non-erodible implants. And this relates to the fact that not every drug may be suitable for implantation, and not every implant formulation may be suitable for long-term administration in humans. This is a study that was published by the uh, group from Merck who were interested in developing 
a long-acting implant of their hepatitis B drug in Tecavir. And in a paper published in 2019, they found that this Entecavir implant actually resulted in local inflammation and tissue necrosis in animals, probably as a consequence of an immune reaction to the way the drug was being released over time in tissues, probably not a reaction to the components of the implant itself, which are thought to be biologically inert. But this suggests that we need to be careful about implant development and make sure the implants we are developing are safe in animal models before taking them into humans. Similar reactions have been reported with some candidate tenofovir implants. And so this is not something confined to entecovir. I'm gonna switch now and in the last half of my talk, I'm going to discuss transdermal drug delivery using microneedle array patches. Why consider transdermal drug delivery instead of injection or implantation? Well, transdermal patches have potential advantages over injectables or some implantables. They can, of course, be removed after the patch is applied. They can be applied by the patient or by a family member and don't require coming to the clinic. Pharmacokinetics may not be dependable on the site of placement, although that requires greater study, but patches can remain in place for days or weeks, as we have learned with patches used for hormone replacement or nicotine addiction cessation. They are also appropriate, unlike implants and injections, for short-term drug delivery. For example, once a day or once a week. And that has real advantages in settings like infants and newborns who have difficulty taking oral antiretroviral medication. But as compared to implants or injectables, microarray patches have some potential disadvantages. There are a limited number of drug candidates that are sufficiently potent to allow formulation in a microarray patch. They have a complex manufacturing process. They are expensive to manufacture, therefore. Like implants, they, are, they have a complicated regulatory environment being regulated as both a drug and a device, and there may be difficulty moving them to a generic marketplace for low and middle income countries. One makes a microarray patch by loading the nanoformulated drug at high concentration into aqueous gels that are then cast into a mold. After they dry, you apply a border adhesive and an occlusive backing layer to form the actual transdermal microarray array device. This base plate needs to readily detach once these microarrays or so-called microneedles dissolve in the skin. In addition to formulation with unmodified drug, you can also use nanoformulated drug uh, in these microarray patches. And with nanoformulated drug, once they are deposited subcutaneously, they form a, a, a nanoformulated depot to release drugs slowly over time for absorption by the rich dermal microcirculation. And I'll show you some examples of that shortly. These, this is a figure from Ryan Donnelly's group at Queen's University in Belfast with a cartoon showing how a microneedle or microarray patch is made. And this is a, a photo micrograph of the final microneedle, uh, in this case formulated with a single drug, but you could also formulate uh, microneedles with multiple drugs. In addition, as I said earlier, you can take nanoparticles, as shown here, to create a microneedle that is essentially a Christmas tree of nanoparticles. And once these microneedles are inserted under the skin, they form a, a subdermal reservoir for gradual drug release 
similar to the strategy achieved with intramuscular injection of long-acting cabotegravir or rilpivirine. In fact, this is what a traverine microarray uh, patch looks like in terms of pharmacokinetic profile in an animal model. These are, again, data from Ryan Donnelly's group that he graciously shared with me. Looking at the pharmacokinetic profile of an atraverine microarray patch in animals in the red line and the green line as compared to intravenous atraverine at two and a half milligrams per kilogram. And as compared to the intravenous atraverine, which still has a fairly long half-life, the microarray patch in these animals produces very gradual release of this drug, whether given as the unmodified drug or as the nanoformulated drug in the green, which produces a higher trough concentration. And this is over a period of nearly a month. Similarly, for cabotegravir, cabotegravir microneedles or a cabotegravir microarray patch in an animal model produces very good controlled release over time of cabotegravir um, in the plasma. In the blue line here is cabotegravir, the formulation we're familiar with, cabotegravir LA, given intramuscularly to these same animals at a dose of two and a half milligrams per rat. In the red line is a nanoformulated cabotegravir microneedle, and in the green line is the uh, is a is a straightforward cabotegravir uh, formulation. And what you can see is that you get higher initial concentrations with the with the nanoformulated cabotegravir, but at the end of at, at the end of a month, the concentrations are quite similar. However, uh, all three formulations achieve concentrations of cabotegravir that are far higher than the target, which in this case is four times the protein-adjusted IC90. It's important to point out that the cabotegravir microarray patches require uh, uh, nearly five times the dose to achieve concentrations that are about half uh, or less what one would achieve with the long-acting cabotegravir um, injection. And so in this particular model, if we want to achieve concentrations that are similar to or identical to cabotegravir intramuscular injection, uh, we, it looks like we still have some work to do. We have done uh, modeling in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Liverpool to look at concentrations of cabotegravir after applying a modeled 30 to 60 centimeter square microarray patch in adult humans. These are data that were published last year in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. And what you can see is that depending upon the mass dose of the microarray patch and depending upon the release rate that the patch achieves, uh, concentrations of cabotegravir may be released over a 28-day period after an application of a single patch that maintained concentrations above the target, which in this case is the trough concentration achieved in humans after taking a 25 milligram oral dose. What does it feel like to wear a microneedle patch? Well, this is a human volunteer, in this case me, wearing a candidate microneedle patch. Um, in this case, a patch containing placebo, at least I was told it contained placebo, provided by colleagues at a company in Singapore that makes microarray patches for clinical use. I put this patch on in the morning thinking it would uh, uh, bother me, but in fact, after application, I walked around all day with this patch on my hand and removed it at the end of the day. And what I saw was nothing but normal skin. Applying this patch feels a little bit like taping a piece of sandpaper to your hand. It doesn't hurt. And removing it, I could not even tell where the patch was. These microneedles 
are like a thousand mosquito bites with no itch. And so I think this is a technology that has great promise for antiretroviral drug delivery, particularly in people who have trouble with pills or injections, and especially in populations like infants and children. Ryan Donnelly's group has been working with um, engin an engineering company to create a microneedle patch that turns color when it is appropriately applied to the skin. And so in this example, when appropriate contact pressure is applied to the patch, the exterior of the patch, the external surface turns red. So the patient or the person applying the patch knows that it has been properly applied. Three quarters of the human volunteers who received such a patch preferred it over the microneedle patch uh, with, uh, without this red censored uh, indicator. So that is the end of today's presentation. I want to thank my collaborators who provided me with much of this data, particularly collaborators at Johns Hopkins University, Stanford University, the University of Liverpool, and especially Ryan Donnelly at Queen's University in Belfast, who shared with me this unpublished data on a variety of antiretroviral microarray patches used in animal models. This was from a presentation he gave at the annual LEAP workshop in March of this year. Um, I also want to acknowledge the funding sources who support my work in long-acting device development, and particularly the long-acting extended release antiretroviral research resource program LEAP, and you can learn more about us at this website. Now, we would be happy to answer questions from the audience and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for the lovely talk. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening um, again. Uh, so we are here with uh, um, Marco, my co-chair, and uh, Professor Flexner, Charlie, uh, and we're going to answer the questions that you are sending through. Unfortunately, as Marco said at the beginning of the session, Edmund cannot be here. Um, I would like to start with some questions on long-acting agents, the, mainly the one that we are going to use in the near future, like abotegravir and repivirin, but this can actually be, I think, expanded to everything. Um, and uh, I'm not going to ask the question to myself, Charlie and Marco, so you're going to help me answering it. And uh, um, so, first of all, are genetic factors um, influencing the pharmacokinetics of the long-acting drugs. Um, I can say that I already discussed, you know, men versus women, so uh, sex and birth differences. Is there anything else you would like to add on that? Well, Marta, I, it's a fascinating question. We really don't have much in the way of data yet. Of course, uh, genetic factors that affect clearance in the classical way, renal or hepatic clearance, would be similarly expected to affect the systemic clearance of a long-acting administered drug after it's released from its reservoir. But there's a perhaps a more interesting question about whether genetic factors might influence the rate of release or absorption of the uh, long-acting agent from its reservoir. And so one could imagine um, uh, genetic polymorphisms and drug transport proteins, for example, influencing the rate at which a, a long-acting agent enters the systemic circulation after release from its site of, uh, of depot. Um, but the, these are the very early days of this kind of research. And as far as I'm aware, we don't really have uh, 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 data on this topic yet. I, I think it's something we'll be looking for in the coming years. Yeah, no, I fully agree. That's that's really useful. And also related to that, um, there was a question from Dr. Cattaneo about whether we actually should TDM the long-acting uh, agents, maybe especially over the first few weeks to really understand when is the second injection 
going to happen, whether we can avoid uh, low concentrations, whether we can actually model what's going to happen over at least over the first year, which is when the very few but the virological failures were seen in the registrational clinical trials. And I think it's a fantastic idea, especially from an expert pharmacology. I think that uh, when, when I started in the field, and, and Charlie, you were definitely there, we were talking a lot about TDM of antiretrovirals, and we were always highlighting the limitations about the use of TDM, because what we don't want in clinical practice uh, is to introduce a drug that actually requires additional tests that are then difficult to, um, to, to get, they're difficult to request, they, the laboratory have to set up, especially when we want these drugs to actually provide a benefit and be used as by many people as possible. So I don't know whether you have any comments on, on that. I, I think it's an excellent suggestion for um, injectable formulations like cavitabrevir and rilpivirine. Um, particularly as we collect more data, which you shared with us uh, today, um, about the relationship between low drug concentrations and risk of developing drug resistance. Um, and so I think TDM very well may be a useful adjunct to administering um, these kinds of formulations. Uh, I, I would say TDM would be, the, the, the longer the uh, uh, interval for the placement of the long-acting agent, uh, probably the less useful TDM would be. But um, I, I think these are, th this is a, uh, it's a really nice thought and, and hopefully people like uh, 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 Dr. Cataneo will, uh, will be pursuing this soon. We'll ask him to develop that and help us. <laughs> Um, Charlie, a couple of questions on your talk. Um, could you uh, define tune antiretroviral therapy and variability in PK profile in a population? So, like um, when, so which drugs are, are, are very potent? Is PK variability an issue uh, in this in the kind of uh, delivery uh, tools that you you described? So, so pharmacokinetic variability is de largely dependent upon the formulation um, and the uh, route of delivery. And, and so one of the potential advantages of long-acting delivery over uh, uh, systemic delivery over oral delivery is reduced pharmacokinetic variability in a population. Um, but as you pointed out in your talk, Marta, um, uh, there can be variability in intramuscular inject injections of long-acting formulations based on site of injection and uh, based on sex. So you, you showed us difference in pharmacokinetics on average in females versus males receiving cavitegravir and rilpivirine intramuscular. And I think that's a very good example of um, how the sources of variability for long-acting formulations may be different than the kinds of sources of variability we think about for oral agents. Um, and and um, I think the goal ultimately is to use long-acting formulations to reduce population variability, um, but there may be some circumstances where uh, that's an issue we're gonna have to pay attention to. Yeah. And Marco, feel free to chip in. Yes. So Tim Cressy is asking us which is our favorite, our preferred long-acting agents for children, including neonates and adolescents. What it's, do we think? I was going to ask you exactly that question. But there you go. Faster than, faster than me. In there. And I just wanted to complement what uh, Charlie was saying before. Uh, in some cases, we actually observe larger inter interpatient variability for long acting than for oral drugs. So there is surely some interesting uh, research to be done in that area. But I agree with Tim um, that it's a priority is not to focus on adults and average uh, uh, patients, but for I start to think how we can bridge the use of these formulations in yeah. children, adolescents. And I mean, for, for everybody, the patches that Charles described would be amazing exactly. because I think for children and neonates, uh, long-acting oral drugs, if they are 
mixed with the formula and, and food when they're weaned and, and so on would be actually really good. Uh, injections, I wouldn't advise it, but obviously the, if the patch is as safe as it seems, it would be great for all ages. Obviously, the, the doses and concentrations for young children need to be uh, studied. Um, Charlie, uh, are the... Mark, my, Mark, sorry, go ahead, please. Can I just add to that by saying that um, I, I think the development pathway for these formulations for infants and children are going to be different than they are for adults, specifically mm -hmm. because body size and metabolism is changing so rapidly. Um, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, paradoxically, uh, I think the longer the the longer the duration of drug release, the less desirable the formulation for infants and children. And, and that's why I think microarray patches really hold great promise for young younger patients because they're removable and because they can be scaled so easily. And so one can imagine for a microarray patch, one could simply cut or reduce the size of the patch based on the age or the weight of the individual and, and then uh, uh, have a patch that is designed to deliver drug for a few weeks and then you switch to a larger patch and you keep scaling up as the individual grows and ages. And, and that's unlike what you're able to do with an intramuscular injection or an implant, which I think would be much less desirable for this uh, uh, patient population. So to me, that's one of the real promises. That's of, really helpful. Uh, and you, I hope you're partly now to answering Paul Domanico's question, which is about an essay but he was asking about the, the importance of focusing the attention on the reversible long acting rather than the, the, the very, very, very long acting that are very difficult to study and understand safety long-term and, and so on. Um, so few, few last questions. Do you know um, if these kind of patches are actually used in other treatments, in other therapies, in other areas, or in vaccines, the one that you showed us? So the, the uh, microarray patches have, are being developed clinically for vaccine delivery, Marta. They um, have not been tested in humans yet for any other application. But I think the plan is certainly to begin that process within the next two to three years. And I think we will see microarray patches being tested in humans soon. Um, to, to get back to Paul Domenico's original question about the attractiveness of removable versus non-removable um, long-acting formulations, um, I think from a regulatory perspective, removable formulations are certainly more appealing because they don't they don't bring with them the same degree of concern about development of irreversible side effects or serious side effects. Um, but the, the, other, the other thing we need to think about is the cost of manufacture and the cost of delivery. And so there may be some applications where an intramuscular injection would be more cost effective than marching through the pathway required to develop a generic implant or even a microarray patch. Um, and so the, the, in the, looking at the hormonal contraceptive field, the one thing that has made injectable DMPA so popular is it's inexpensive to manufacture and um, it can be uh, administered by essentially any trained healthcare, healthcare personnel. And, and so, you know, as we're, we're entering new territory here when it comes to development and understanding of the risks and benefits of long-acting formulations. And, and we do need to think globally about um, the rules that are gonna apply when these formulations are developed for high-income countries versus the rules that are gonna apply when these formulations are developed for low- and middle-income countries. Great. There, is a, there are a lot of fantastic questions, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the director is telling me to wrap up. 
Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for sending the question, for taking part. Thank you, Marco, for co-chairing, Charlie and Edwin for the lovely talks. And uh, you have now a half an hour break, a bit less than half an hour break, and we'll see you for the next session in uh, half an hour. Enjoy your coffee.